This is Gene Therapy for Hemophilia, Dream or Reality, a show on behalf of the Canadian Hemophilia Society. Here's your host, David Page. It's a pleasure to introduce our guest for today's podcast, Dr. Glenn Pierce. Glenn is a physician, a longtime researcher in coagulation products, and current medical vice president of the World Federation of Hemophilia. Welcome, Glenn. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here again. We're at the beginning of the the first generation of of hemophilia gene therapy. Today's therapies with an AAV vector are not for everyone. And and you've talked about that in your previous uh, podcast. They're not approved for children. Results are variable from person to person and unpredictable. Their durability is in question, especially with hemophilia A. And corticosteroids are often needed in the first year after administration to counteract the body's rejection of the AAV vector. Some people, even if eligible, prefer to wait. So what might they be waiting for? There is a lot coming along. I I always say uh, each decade, this is the most exciting time for hemophilia bleeding disorders research. And that remains true today. This is the most exciting time for bleeding disorders research. So we have um, these remarkable technology advancements that began with the identification of cryoprecipitate by Judith Graham Poole at Stanford University in 1964. And that really ushered in, although that cryo was only for hemophilia A patients, it ushered in the beginning of the plasma fractionation industry to produce clotting factor concentrates, factor 9 and factor 8, by the late 60s. And as we know, things moved fairly rapidly, more and more purified clotting factors, the unintended consequences of viral infections that precipitated uh, the development of viral inactivation technologies so that by the mid 80s, most products were completely safe for HIV and the hepatitis viruses. And then that also ushered in the development of recombinant factor eight and factor nine. Both of those molecules were cloned or identified at their gene structures in 1984 for factor VIII, 1982 for factor IX. And so by 1992, the first factor VIII, recombinant factor VIII, was introduced to the marketplace. Very fast clinical trial development. It took a bit longer for factor IX, 1997 was the first approval for factor IX. Because uh, the major companies didn't think that it would be profitable enough, but a small biotech called Genetics Institute thought that it would be, and in fact it was. And so that ushered in the recombinant era for hemophilia A and hemophilia B. But then we had a long period where not much technology development occurred. Some of that may have been due to the fact that these drugs were patented and people were just uh, pharmaceutical companies were making profits without doing a whole lot of research to figure out what the next step would be. Patents all ran out in the 2000s, aughts. And so then companies got serious about working on extended half-life products. The first extended half-life products were approved in 2014. Others came along in the subsequent few years. And then just three years after the first extended half-life products were approved, a bispecific antibody, a factor VIII mimetic, was approved for inhibitor patients in 2018 for non-inhibitor patients that really has changed the face of technology for hemophilia, at least for hemophilia A. It's subcutaneous. It can be given as little as once a month. There are two additional monoclonal antibodies that are coming along that are purported to have improvements over this initial one. We'll see what the data look like. But in any event, we'll have three likely in the next few years, unless one of them shows too much toxicity. They can be used for hemophilia A patients. And then there are a whole family of rebalancing agents that are in the pipeline. Yeah. So that's a new technology, a new concept, I should say, with a variety of different technologies associated with it. Our clotting systems, if they're normal, have a balance between clotting and not clotting. Because if we get a break in a capillary or a blood vessel, we need to quickly clot it with all of the factors that get activated very fast within seconds in a sequence. But we need to stop it, too. If we don't stop it, then we get widespread clotting that can kill us, and that's thrombosis. And so we have a balance between the positive factors and the negative factors. What a whole host of different groups have done is to take these 
negative factors and make inhibitors to them to prevent them from acting. People with hemophilia just have a small amount of procoagulant activity, a normal amount of negative activity. Bring the negative activity down and you have a better balance with the procoagulant activity. And therefore, you can get, in some cases, normal clotting. They're not without risk, and they have had some thrombotic problems if you go too low on knocking out the the anticoagulation activity. But with further experimentation and balancing, one product is now approved in Canada for patients who have factor IX deficiency and inhibitors or neutralizing antibodies to factor IX. At that product, I'm sure, is looking to get wider approval because it could potentially be used for factor eight, factor nine without inhibitors, as well as for rare bleeding disorder. There's another similar product like that. They're both called anti-TFPIs, tissue factor pathway inhibitor. So tissue factor pathway inhibitor inhibits the procoagulant activity. If you knock that out, then you get more procoagulant activity lasting for a longer period of time to clot the blood. There's an RNA, inhibitory RNA, that can block antithrombin. Antithrombin is an important anticoagulant that shuts down clotting. If we inhibit antithrombin, we can get more coagulation. This has been in the, tr- in the clinical trials now for probably seven or eight years. It's had some hiccups along the way, but is getting close to finishing phase three, additional phase three studies and may be available to individuals with all sorts of different bleeding disorders. So these are examples of products that are coming along that employ entirely new technologies and new pathways in order to treat bleeding disorders. Back to gene therapy for a minute. Uh, Right now, the uh, age for eligibility is 18 years. Is it possible that could decrease in the future with the current uh, technologies? So it may decrease somewhat. We don't know how young a patient needs to be in order for gene therapy to be effective. It is thought, based on animal studies, that newborns, for instance, their livers are growing so fast, and the liver is the target for the AAV gene therapy, that they'll lose their activity within months or years or so. And so there's really no point in in doing an infant. But at what point would it last for a longer period of time? And as you know, for hemophilia B, it looks as if it does last for a very long period of time. So it would be reasonable to go into, it's, it's approved for 18 and above, it would be reasonable to go into 12 to 18. That's looking good to go into 6 to 12. If that's looking good, go into 0 to 6 and begin to see how long will it last and And will it be a more permanent kind of a cure, uh, as it appears to be for adults? For hemophilia A, it's a different situation, because many people with hemophilia A, with the treatment that's approved today, are losing their activity. And so does that make any sense then, if you know that adults are losing activity, to go into teenagers? The critical question there is that once you've received an AAV gene therapy, it's unlikely you can receive another one because you've made a huge antibody response that will last for decades. And so that's a problem. It's a once and done kind of thing. If it doesn't last, you're going to need to identify another technology that could cure hemophilia. And what are those new technologies or or technologies that are being, I guess, dreamed about in, in, in research? There's several different approaches. One is to work with AAV and to improve it to make it more efficient, to figure out why it's not durable in hemophilia A and to fix that problem, and to essentially be able to give a lower dose so one doesn't encounter the toxicity but still gets the efficacy. So there's a lot of labs that are working not just in hemophilia but in a variety of different monogenic disorders or congenital disorders ranging from alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency to glycogen storage diseases to cystic fibrosis, muscular dystrophy. They're all working with AAV trying to make it better because everybody's encountering similar problems with uh, getting good efficiency and seeing too much toxicity. And so that's one approach. Another approach is to work with AAV outside of the body. 
So to take some bone marrow cells, take them out of the body, which is a pretty easy thing to do. You can just actually do that through a, a, a venipuncture. Culture them, purify out different cell types. You can incubate them with AAV outside of the body. And the AAV will deliver your transgene of interest, factor nine, factor eight. And then you can grow them up and put them back in as stem cells into the bone marrow and potentially make factor eight or factor nine. So, so this work is, is being done with AAV and factor nine now and um, may be ready for the clinic in as little as a year. There would be no age restrictions other than safety considerations. You could give this to an infant and they would get a lifelong cure because the AAV would deposit this directly into, uh, into those cells and they would last for a very long period of time. So that's a different approach for AAV. The, the third approach also is ex vivo or outside of the body. And it involves a different kind of a vector. It's called a lentiviral vector. It's part of the retrovirus family. Retroviruses integrate into the DNA. And so we've all been infected with various retroviruses in the past that don't necessarily cause disease. But we have pieces of these retroviruses inside of our chromosomes that have been there for millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years. And so that's what retroviruses do. They can get into the DNA, into the chromosomes, and stay there permanently. So one can then deliver factor nine or factor eight in a modified kind of a retrovirus that would then get integrated and remain there for the duration of your life. And so there are now three different clinical trials that are ongoing with a retrovirus delivering they're all three delivering the factor eight gene or a, mod a modified factor eight gene. One in India, one in Atlanta, and one in Wisconsin that would avoid all of the toxicities and uncertainties of AAV. In addition, something I haven't mentioned is that factor eight doesn't fit very well into AAV. And so that's probably causing some problems as well that aren't well-defined, but may involve increased immunity to this vector, this virus. And so factor eight fits very well into a retrovirus. That wouldn't be an issue there. You'd get the whole gene placed in there. That's another approach. And then the final approach is non-viral. And so that means not using a virus. As I think I've mentioned, viruses and hosts, such as ourselves, uh, have an antagonistic relationship. Their job is to infect us. Our job is to prevent them from infecting us. And as a result, we set up an immune response anytime we see this foreign thing, this virus. And so that causes all kinds of toxicity along the way, and including in some, uh, in some cases with very high doses of AAV, death of children. And so it's not without consequence. By going non-viral, we're eliminating all of that because a non-viral delivery doesn't use the virus, doesn't use the coat of the virus that's very immunogenic and cause an immune response. It simply gets the DNA into the cell. It's not as efficient as a virus. It has had limited success in non-human primates, which is the, the way we test this before it goes into humans. And so if it's been limited in non-human primates, nobody's going to take it into a human yet. But people are continuing to make progress in that area. And I think eventually we will figure out how to replicate a virus without it causing all of the toxicity by artificial means, using lipids and fats to, to create an artificial kind of a virus that won't cause an immune response. And what about gene editing? You know, we've all heard about CRISPR-Cas9 technology where you actually cut and splice the gene into the DNA. Is that being, being researched? It is, and that would also give a permanent effect. There's good news and bad news there. The good news is that it's been shown in, in a few different systems to work in non-human primates at least one company is getting ready to take this into the clinic next year. The bad news is that they need to deliver the factor nine gene inside of an AAV. And so 
you have some of the baggage of the AAV, but not all of the baggage of it, because you're really just hoping to get the, the gene in, and then you deliver the the gene editing machinery that takes that gene and pops it into the chromosome. And then the AAV goes away, the gene editing machinery goes away, and the patient should be left with a permanent factor IX production within their chromosomes. So it's been done more for factor IX, including in non-human primates, and so it's, it's looking pretty good with the caveat that you still require AAV. But for factor VIII, it's a much larger gene, and so that has continued to be problematic for gene editing. So there are uh, lots of of things uh, going on. How hopeful are you that one of these or several of these will will actually work uh, and work well? And how long do you think it might take? So I have a split personality. I am a cup half empty guy, and I am a cup half full guy. So in the long term, I am cup half full. I think that there's no question but that we will see the all the bleeding disorders cured over the next 20, 25, 30 years. Uh, and that includes the rare bleeding disorders, factor 7, factor 10, factor 11, von Willebrand disease as well. But it will take more time. We'll need more technology improvements along the way. So I'm very excited about all of that. And it's inevitable because there are so many people working on this for hemophilia and other bleeding disorders, as well as for a variety of other diseases where if they have success there, it's directly applicable to hemophilia. So that's exciting. Where I'm a cup half empty guy is that I always, I always try to anticipate the worst. I've done a lot of drug development in my, in my career. Some things have worked, things haven't. I don't have expectations that things will work. If they work, I'm pleasantly surprised and happy. But if they don't work, I know that we just need to go back and continue to fix it. Fix the problems, identify, well, first identify the problems, and then fix the problems along the way. And that takes time, resources, money to do that. But we've made remarkable progress with gene therapy. On the one hand, you might say we've been working on this now for really 30 years. What have we accomplished? Well, we have two products that are approved. They're first-generation products. There will continue to be improvements made upon them for second and third along the lines that we've talked about. Gene editing, improved AAVs, other viral delivery systems, that sort of thing. But it's been remarkable just in this period of time how far we've come because we've encountered so many hurdles along the way that have shut programs down. Most gene therapy that has been done to date, where it's been com- the trials have been completed, has failed. It's, it's all failed. There are very few successes, the two hemophilias being notable. And there's a handful of other successes along the way, but really you could count them on five, on five fingers on one hand. So that tells you the number of failed attempts But each of those failed attempts has taught us something that has allowed us to get to this point. And that's the sort of technology development, iterative technology development that will continue. So for a half-empty guy, you're actually pretty hopeful. I am. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I'm patient, too. You know, I've been at this for 30 years. We see some progress along the way. I'm, I'm excited about the progress we've seen, but I'm more excited about what the future can hold. We, we need gene therapy to cure the bleeding disorders. And when I say cure, I mean get us into normal range, not having to think about hemophilia, having a hemophilia-free mind or a bleeding disorders-free mind, and being able to, to achieve a quality of life that is fully comparable to anybody else. Uh, who has good health. And so we're making a lot of progress there just with the treatments that have come along, the extended half-life products, the factor eight mimetics, these rebalancing agents that will be coming, I'm hopeful for. But we still have a ways to go to actually get to a cure. And maybe we're there with factor nine, and maybe for a few patients with factor eight, they're going to be there for an extended period of time. But we need to do more work in this area to make it more predictable, to make factor eight more durable, uh, and to decrease the variability. You know, we can't, 
we can't develop drugs where you get 5% or you get 110%, which is the case for factor 9. Or for factor 8, you get 0% or 400%. That's not good drug development philosophy. That's where we're at now, but that doesn't mean that's where we'll be in the future. Well, thanks, Glenn. Thanks for, for doing this podcast and sharing your, your thoughts with us. And also thanks for all your work over three decades, four decades uh, as a physician and researcher. Right. Well, it's been a pleasure, David. I really appreciate you inviting me on. Thank you. Bye now. For more information on gene therapy, we invite you to check out other podcasts in the series, Hemophilia Gene Therapy, Dream or Reality. For more information, we invite you to check out more episodes in this series, Hemophilia Gene Therapy, Dream or Reality. This podcast series was made possible by an unrestricted educational grant from Pfizer Canada to the Canadian Hemophilia Society.